There were three ravens sat on a tree Down a down, hey down a down They were as black as they might be With a down One of them said to his mate Where shall we our breakfast take? With a down, dairy, 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 down, down. Hello and welcome to a special Advent 2023 edition of the Three Ravens podcast. My name is Martin Vaux. I'm a writer, storyteller and English romanticism obsessive. And I'm joined, as ever, by my partner in crime and all dark arts, Eleanor Conlon. Hello! We're counting down to Christmas over 12 days of mini episodes, culminating in our Three Ravens Christmas special on Christmas Day itself. Mm -hmm. And we're using the 12 Days of Christmas song as a very loose justification for talking about interesting historical and folkloric tidbits loosely related to Yuletide. Day three, ten pipers piping. Now, Martin, when we talk about pipes, I imagine we're talking about one of the very earliest forms of musical instrument. Well, we presume the voice and percussion were the earliest forms of instrument, but basic pipes and what we today call woodwind instruments are pretty darn ancient. How old are we talking here? Well, the oldest example we know of is a Neanderthal flute dating back 60,000 years. And that one is carved from the left thigh bone of a bear. Whoa, a bare bone flute. That's so cool. Yep. I mean, we only have part of it, as you might expect, but it's agreed to have been deliberately designed with regular hole placings and so on, with the same basic design evident in cultures all over the world. Specifically, it's what's known today as a fipple flute, with six holes covering two octaves. Fipple is a silly word. Oh, agreed. What does it mean? Well, it's believed to have its origins in Icelandic, relating to horse lips. But as anyone who's ever looked at a pipe or flute will know, the design is pretty simple, really, with a mouthpiece with a channel carved into it, forming a duct that directs air across an opening towards a sharp edge. The edge then splits the air in a manner that causes a vibration, the sounds of which can be changed through blocking and opening holes further down the instrument. As you know, I started learning the recorder as a child and then played the flute and still regularly play the recorder and the flute Mm. to varying degrees of success. (laughs) But I'm wondering, when did people start calling a flute a flute and not just a pipe? So around the 11th century in England and Norman France, the word pipe is older and onomatopoeic, meaning it sounds like the noise of piping. And technically, these days, we distinguish between the two because pipes have reeds, also found in pipe organs, and interestingly, horn pipes, with the vibrating reed causing the column of air in the pipe to vibrate. In flutes and organ flu pipes, though, the stream of air passes that same sharp edge, which sets up vibrations in the pipe's air column. And I know for you, the pipe is pretty intrinsically linked to lyric poetry, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely right. I think most people will be familiar with the basic form of pipe I was referring to before, like the barebone pipe, because it was and is such a symbol of shepherds from all over the world. And we, of course, have the pan pipe as well. Yeah, associated with the god Pan, another key symbol in Europe of the pastoral and the lyrical. Pan pipes made, of course, by having pipes of all sorts of different lengths strapped together, each one making a different note when blown across. But in ancient Greek poetry, in addition to the pipe, shepherds, who had lots of time on their hands as they watched their flocks, also made and carried little harp-type instruments known as lyres, normally with seven strings. And from the shepherd with his pipe and lyre, we get the word lyric and the birth of one of the major forms of early poetry. Um, Without wanting to get too far off our topic for the day, which is, of course, pipers piping, uh, just define lyric poetry. Okay, so... um, Um, This is a whole thing, but basically today we understand lyric poetry as personal poetry. So poetry grown out of the tradition of songs and ballads as distinct from, say, 
epic poetry, like Homer wrote. Lyric poetry is basically the kind of poetry coming out of music which is beautiful and about feeling, and which you can trace back to shepherds singing out their woes and joys and thoughts around a campfire. So very much what your romantics were all about. Oh, very much so. And if you want a touchstone for this kind of thing, definitely read John Milton's poem Lycidas, which harks back to the romantic worlds of the ancient Greeks and Romans, and kind of opens the door for Coleridge and Wordsworth and Byron and Shelley and Keats. But I digress. It's very interesting digression. <laughs> Still, coming back to Pipes, yes. I think I'm right in saying that when we think about early music, the two essential building blocks were basically the pipe and tabor, the tabor being a drum. Yeah, exactly right. If not a tabor, then a bell or string drum. But the pipe was absolutely the early modern instrument. The tabor pipe in particular became a specific instrument with three holes so that a single person could play it with one hand and a drum with the other. And this developed into the flageolet, which is a pretty popular instrument right up until the 19th century. So yesterday we were talking about ladies dancing mm. and you mentioned the shawm, which yes. I've got to say is one of my favourite yeah. instruments. What a wild and crazy sound you get out of a shawm. Yeah, it's a noise that's pretty out of fashion. I can't <laughs> imagine Taylor Swift getting very far if her new album really foregrounds the shawm. Maybe not, but <laughs> but <laughs> It would be a great volume for all that arena touring yes, she does. That's and true. The Shawm does not have an indoor voice. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Now, the Shawm is the direct ancestor of the modern oboe, with a double reed like the oboe. And it was a super popular musical instrument in the Middle Ages, into the Renaissance. And the Shawm is really important because, like a lot of pipes, their range was quite limited. People are probably familiar in terms that we might relate to choirs. So we have soprano alto, tenor, bass, you know, working down from high to low. Now, what made the difference for woodwind instruments or pipes in early music was, of course, size. As in, the bigger the instrument, the deeper the sound. Yeah, exactly. So people called instruments like the shawm consort instruments because they played alongside other instruments, offering different sounds into that range from higher pitch to low, with pipes having a really important and notable limitation. The limitation being? Well, the size of the human hand. Ah. Because, of course, in order to play the pipe, the holes couldn't be too far apart. And this led to the invention of physical keys in pipes. So buttons you could press to lift up holes further apart than fingers could reach. And the shawm is the very first piped instrument with a key. So is the introduction of the key in a shawm the first major development in the pipes evolution since, well, what did you say, 60,000 years ago? Well, no, because you did have more holes being made in flutes and pipes across time. We have ancient examples from China 9,000 years ago, as well as ancient Mesopotamia almost 6,000 years Years ago, and references to pipe music and even some music on cuneiform tablets written out, dating from the same time we get the very first literature in the form of the Epic of Gilgamesh. From that, we can kind of then assert that pipes have existed maybe even longer than stories. Well, maybe. In terms of recorded stories, we have pipes that are much older than our oldest stories. And, of course, pipes and flutes appear reasonably regularly in, say, the Old Testament and the Hebrew Bible, with tons of ancient pipes having been found by archaeologists from across the Bronze and Iron Ages. It's a bit wild, isn't it? When you really think about it, the pipe is so baked into human life and civilization. Well, very much so. And there are loads and loads of types, of course, from the the ocarina, to the recorder, to the tin whistle, to the piccolo, with another major change happening when the modern flute, or baroque flute as it's also known, came about, with people holding the instrument sideways and blowing into it transverse, as it's known, rather than honking into it end on. <laughs> And you, you mentioned uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh before mm. and the god Pan who symbolises freedom and nature and the Bible. But when we think about folklore, does the pipe play much of a role? Well, we briefly touched on the Pied Piper of Hamlin yesterday. And in terms of Pan, are you familiar with the story of where his Pan pipes came from? I confess I'm not. Where did they come from? Well, as is a bit of a feature of classical myth, Pan, this god, 
fell in love with a beautiful nymph called Cyrinx. These male deities are shockers, aren't they? They really are. And this comes to us via Ovid, by the way, in the Metamorphosis. Anyhow, Cyrinx, this nymph, was chased and didn't want anything to do with naughty old Pan, who was chasing her about, wanting to have his wicked way. So Cyrinx ran into the river Ladon and prayed to Artemis, a famously chaste goddess, who transformed her into a bed of reeds. Pan followed her to the riverside. Then she was was nowhere to be found, so he sort of huffed angrily and noticed the pleasant sound it made when his breath passed over the reeds. He therefore hacked Cyrinx down and turned her into a musical instrument, her beautiful song being the basis of all panpipe music. Oh no! <laughs> Cyrinx, goodness me! Greek myths can be so savage, can't they? Oh, definitely. I mean, the myth about the invention of the flute isn't much better. Is that the one about Athena? Yeah, so the goddess Athena, in an idle moment, invents the flute, but doesn't like it because because when she blows into it, she thinks her face looks ugly. <laughs> Hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so Athena curses her flute and throws it away. Only it's found by a satyr or fawn called Marcias. And Marcias has no such qualms. He starts rocking out on his flute, playing beautiful music, drawing animals to him, nymphs, men, all sorts. And this then cheeses off Apollo, who had invented his own beautiful musical instrument, the lyre. Wait, is this linking back to what you were saying earlier about shepherds and it the lyre? It is indeed, because Apollo was furious with Marcias, making everyone jig and dance with his crude and nasty flute, while <laughs> Apollo was delicately strumming his lyre and people weren't quite so into it. So Apollo called on the nymphs to judge a kind of battle of the bands between Marcias and himself, with Marcias being very cocky about the whole thing, telling Apollo he'd beat him every which way and fair play to Marsyas he you know continued to rock out and all present turned into a sort of frenzy of dancing maybe catching dancing plague but they all lost their minds for a while until it was Apollo's turn and Apollo played his lyre and everyone thought it was incredibly beautiful they all had tears in their eyes and hearts in their throats but it was still looking to be a draw all until Apollo then started singing while he played. And the power of this, the combination of words and music, saw everyone agreeing that Apollo had won hands down. I feel like this isn't going to end well for Marcia. Well, no, he did find a cursed flute, and so, you know, a solid guess. Because for daring to challenge a god, Apollo tied Marseus to a pine tree and flayed off his skin, his tears then becoming the river Marseus, which flows on to this day. Wow. Again with these horrid Greek gods. <laughs> I mean, I'm, the juxtaposition of this beautiful lyre music yeah. by Apollo that reduces everyone to tears with this incredibly violent act <laughs> afterwards. Wow, that's startling. I know, I know. But still, when we think about lyric poetry and the pipes and the pastoral tradition, you know, looking after shepherds and flocks, we've got a pretty neat link there back to Christmas, haven't we? Oh, it all connects. <laughs> I feel like I'm having a beautiful mind moment right now. <laughs> well, before you start linking things up with pins, and, and bits of bread string, please tell us, what are you going to be talking about tomorrow? Tomorrow, it's drummer's drumming. Like all the connections, drumming in my mind. <laughs> well, we hope everyone has enjoyed or will enjoy our bonus vestry episode for this week, also out today, all about Krampus, as well as our Patreon-exclusive episode out on Snow Queens, as available to our supporters at patreon.com forward slash three ravens podcast. And until next time, what are pipers of pipe top that way? We'll go this way. And remember, don't whistle till you're out of the woods. God sent every gentleman Such hounds, such hawks and such lean man With a down derry derry